uh, come late, unprepared, and not dressed as though I'm a speaker. Oh. Uh, <laughs> you look just fine. We're ready to go. You're, you look wonderful. All right, it is two o'clock, so we are going to get started. You are going to be hearing from us about creating a speaking career related to your books. And apparently we are being recorded and live streamed. So this is a speaking panel, a panel about speaking, in which we will speak and it will be then further, further streamed to more and more people. So it'll be, it'll be about as public a speaking event as you can get, which is, um, which is Hello great. out so, there. <laughs> yes, hello out there, all of you people watching from afar. Uh, so I'm going to ask each of the panelists first to introduce themselves and say a little bit about what you write and your current speaking career, what types of engagements you do, what do you speak about, to whom, how often, and so on. So let's start on that end with PJ. Hi there. I'm PJ Manny, and I write, right now, a trilogy, book three will come out next year, of near-term science fiction. It's hard SF political techno thriller, so it's a lot of history, a lot of technology. Um, in the process of doing the research for these books, I became an expert in brain-computer interfaces, uh, artificial, uh, sorry, artificial intelligence, robotics, nanoscience, nanomaterials, uh, and interestingly enough, people want to hear about that. Um, they also so want to hear about what I also uh, write about, which is the use of empathy in storytelling, how technology really affects empathy and the ways we take in information about ourselves and each other. Uh, that has gotten most of my speaking gigs, interestingly, have been about uh, talking about storytelling, empathy, and, and new information technologies. That sounds fascinating. <laughs> uh, I'm Sally Wienergrada. Um, I write both speculative and mainstream fiction. Um, and they all are very much about me trying to understand a world that to me is incomprehensible. Uh, my novel, The Winter Boy, which is speculative, uh, has been called a cultural fantasy or a political fantasy. Um, my novel, Jojo, is mainstream, and it's uh, the story of a uh, multiracial uh, Jewish woman raised in a white Christian village that she learns to hate. Um, so what has happened to me is unexpectedly, schools and other organizations are adopting my books to discuss some very important topics about uh, acceptance, prejudice, bias, family misunderstandings. And um, so of course, I and they've been inviting me and I realize it's time to go whole hog into the speaking engagement thing because I know that schools and corporations are mandated to have speakers on this topic. So I've uh, spent a lot of money and time creating a new website. I have all kinds of materials here I'll tell you about in a few minutes. But um, so that's what I speak about a lot. But I also speak about storytelling as a way to build bridges. So I think you and I shall should uh, get into a uh, <laughs> joint thing. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm Mary Haskell. Um, I write children's historical fantasy. Um, my second book, The Handbook for Dry A, no, there's no article, definite or indefinite, in this title, and that's my own fault. Um, Handbook for Dragon Slayers won the uh, Schneider Family Book Award, which is an award given out by the American Library Association for um, representation of disability in children's mm -hmm. fiction. And that is actually what uh, spurred most of my speaking engagements. People want to hear you speak after you've won an award like that in particular. Yeah. So uh, I've done quite a few school visits and then also some other interesting um, one-off kind of of events like I go I go to speak to um, a fair number of college classes about uh, writing for children actually so um, that's me and I'm Fonda Lee I'm going to be moderating the panel I am the author of a few uh, young adult science fiction novels including Zero Boxer EXO which is up for uh, Norton this weekend Ooh. Crossfire which comes out in ten days mm -hmm. and uh, the gangster fantasy saga Jade City, which is up for the Nebula this weekend. And my speaking engagement kind of falls into two camps. So um, 
I speak at schools. A lot of young adult and middle grade authors have kind of a, a, a stream of their career that involves going into schools and speaking to schools um, at uh, writing festivals at the middle school and high school level, and also speaking at writing conferences about writing and, uh, and, and teaching. So that's kind of how I came into it. I would not describe myself as having a speaking career. I don't, I mean, it's, I don't know how many of us would, because I certainly felt like um, the writing came first and the speaking mm -hmm. sort of fell out of it, if you will. So I kind of want to start with that and um, ask, did you expect or hope to build a speaking career out of your writing when you began writing? Because it sounds like we all started as writers predominantly. And now that you have speaking as one of your main activities, how does it complement your writing, if it does at all? Do you want to start? Sure, I'll start. Um, I actually don't speak that much because I still have a day job. And uh, uh, it's kind of demanding. And that makes me set my fee as how much I would have earned at my day job. Um, so, which is actually not an exorbitant fee by any stretch, but uh, it, it is maybe a stopper for some schools. I do offer to do free Skype visits, and so those those get taken up uh, periodically. Um, it waxes and wanes, and it was never my intention to have that kind of career. I also <laughs> didn't intend to write middle grade, so uh, I thought I was writing young, young adult, and uh, it was decided that middle grade was a an appropriate marketing opportunity. <laughs> so, uh, and with that came, you know, going to talk to children, um, which uh, I do love children, like one-on-one -on -one in a group. They're really <laughs> intimidating. Um, <laughs> I, I've had some amazing questions um, and like, you know, how old are you? And uh, why is your hair blue? And um, how old are you again? Like they're really <laughs> obsessed with how old you are. And then my favorite is, is why did you choose to major in anthropology in college? Uh, their parents were anthropology professors and they were curious. So um, it it's kind of strange because I work in an academic library by day to like have this sudden quick jump into a completely different world. And I don't consider it like a speaking career at all. It's, it's a speaking sideline. Writing always came first, always. Um, I've, uh, my day job is writing. I'm a nonfiction writer, and I've made my living and as a writer my entire career. Um, and previously, uh, uh, in another life, uh, I am also a photographer, and uh, my husband and I wrote the first major book on digital photography uh, at a time when I was a contributing editor to PC Magazine. So they started trotting us out as educators in digital photography and imaging at a time when there weren't that many educators on the topic. And um, this relates to this because one of the first things we did was we hired an acting coach hmm. to uh, help, um, help uh, develop our natural banter into something that an audience would want to follow, help, help me stop using my hands all the time when I'm talking, and um, other such uh, refinements so to keep it an, an interesting thing. I shelved that. Once we left uh, Ziff Davis and PC Magazine, I shelved that, went back to just writing. And then this happened, uh, where the acceptance and the interest in my books just sort of skyrocketed into a nice, environment at a time when the glossy magazines where I was making a bulk of my money was falling down. You know, they're being bought up or they're being closed down or they're being run by people who are not willing to pay the kind of money that I need to live on. Um, so I am currently in the process of um, changing the shift. You know, at freelance writers, as all of you know, have to have certain balances, whether it's a day job or whatever. You have to have balance of income and time. So I've reduced the balance of magazines, and I'm currently working on increasing the balance of my, um, of my speaking career, which has led to me creating uh, a whole new website. I have a fabulous coder, um, Peggy O'Connor, who is helping with this, and it's sallywienergrata.com. And working on developing it further. Jay? 
So like all the others, the writing comes first. Because if you have nothing to show them that you have cred in what you do, you're not going to get a speaking career. As well as you speak, as well as you present yourself, it's all about the work that they can refer to. They may never read it. But they're going to look and say, oh, you've been published. And that's really important. Uh, so I fell into speaking, again, ironically, on the academic things that I had written uh, to begin with, uh, and not on the technical things. And I found that uh, colleges, my, my work is definitely not YA, it's way too sexy, uh, way too violent. <laughs> um, so colleges became really intrigued, um, and that's actually a wonderful paying gig. They will pay for your transportation. They will pay you an honorarium, which can be relatively, depending on the school, substantial. Um, I also started talking to uh, professional organizations. Um, Producers Guild of America wanted to know what was the future of media. Uh, Directors Guild of America wanted to know the same thing. Now, I had come from Hollywood, so I had cred in Hollywood, and they were like, oh, but she's a futurist. So I actually, my speaking career became about being styled as a professional futurist. And you really have to put that up front. So when I introduce myself, I'm an author and a professional futurist because no one's going to ask you to speak unless they think you know what you're talking about. And you can know so much about your topic, but if your website doesn't say speaker right up there, they're not going to assume you, you can speak. Um, I also do uh, corporate work, and that's come out of bizarrely uh, both times, and I'm not even allowed to put them on my website because they're not supposed to let anyone know that they don't know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. uh, you'll get that a lot. They'll say, look, we're gonna pay you a nice amount of money, but you cannot advertise this um, because they have their own in-house people who are supposed to be doing those jobs. And they don't want people to know that they've actually corresponded with the outside. Now, most companies will say, sure, of course, put it on your website, put it on your resume, but I just happen to, in by coincidence, get two big corporate gigs that really didn't want to spread that information around. But the flip side is demand to be paid very well for it because you can't use that. You can't advertise for it. Um, so I run the spectrum, again, from, from uh, academia to uh, professional organizations to corporate, and it really has to do, again, with the information that I became an expert at in my books, but also this thing about empathy and storytelling and technology and how to bring connection together and how to really focus on connection. Because if we don't focus on connection, we're all in a lot of trouble. In fact, we could actually say, that's why we're in the trouble we're in right now, politically and around the world. Um, so I guess that that answers the question. <laughs> yeah, um, from my end, you know, I, I started doing speaking related to my books largely as a matter of just saying yes to st stuff. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I wrote a book, it did pretty well, got some awards, and then, you know, schools would be like, oh, do you do school visits? Sure, I do school visits. <laughs> um, and, you know, oh, you're going to pay me. Yeah, I definitely do school visits. <laughs> so, you know, that's kind of how that started. And then, um, selfishly, I started doing some... Um, teaching at writing conferences because when you are on the faculty and you're doing a class on, let's say I do a class on action scenes, uh, I get to attend the writing conference for free, go to all the other programming and get free lunch, which was a big motivation. Um, so good, starting off speaking was kind of a, um, more of a saying yes to people who wanted me to do some stuff and then realizing, hey, this is actually pretty fun. I enjoy it. It's not super hard or onerous for me and it makes it's a nice little side thing uh, so um, I don't feel as though um, the speaking I it doesn't affect the writing but there are opportunities to think about how does the writing lend itself to um, something that you can kind of put your stamp on in terms of what you talk about so um, you know for example I had a book come up for an award and so it, I was like well I could make a discussion actually my publisher said hey in order to get this more um, to make it more relevant for the classroom can you make a discussion guide 
I was like, sure, I can make a discussion guide, right? So you put, a, you put together a discussion guide, put it on your website, um, and my publisher was good about getting it out. So that spurred um, the book being used in classrooms, which in turn spurred the potential for more, um, more school visits. Or you know, looking across at the types of stories I write, I'd be like, well, what is it about my stories that I feel like I can really talk about when it comes to teaching at a writing conference? Um, that I that I you know legitimately think I'm very good at. So um, those are some of the things that go into thinking about it. My question for all of you is, you know, did you have training as a speaker? Because I often have people who say, oh, like I would that I would like to do a school visit, but that sounds terrifying. Or I would like to have more of a speaking career, but I I don't know where to start. I'm not trained. So did you have formal training? Um, and if so, what sort? If you didn't, how did you essentially train yourself or get comfortable as a speaker? Start. AJ, do you want to start? Yeah. Um, so I was a high school theater geek. I was that kid who didn't leave the theater, ate lunch in the theater the whole bit. So uh, had a lot of theater training, trained as a triple threat. Uh, health problems made me leave my dreams. Um, however, it always gave me a grounding. And then working in Hollywood, I was an executive and I was a writer. Um, I knew lots of actors. My very best friend in the whole world is an incredible acting coach. So whenever I get ready for a really big gig, I go back in and I actually join her class just to get really grounded and remember how to connect, remember how to land, and remember to just be especially in a speaking role, yourself. That is the most important thing. You cannot fake this. You can't fake being you. They will sniff you out in a second. And there's really no, you know, it's feeling confident enough to be able to stand up in front of people and anyone can gain that confidence. If you're confident enough to learn how to drive a car, you can learn to be confident enough to stand up and speak to people. There are different techniques that allow you to lose the introvert and explore that. Everybody's got a little bit of extrovert, everybody. I don't care how introverted you claim you are. Um, learning how to focus on that small part, um, that would be, for me, the most important uh, thing. And, and I think, again, that acting training. Although, you know, I use my hands all the time. And I, you know, I would just say if, if, you know, I'm a native New Yorker man, if I can't talk with my hands, I can't I talk. So, <laughs> again, be true to you and yeah. who you are. I agree with you about the hands. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but there were times when it was distracting, when it was, um, you have to know when it's um, appropriate. Uh, because I used to share the stage with my husband, who is now deceased, um, when we would talk like this, if I were doing this, it would break that yes, connection. Uh, so it's knowing when the uh, hands are being used to magnify or emphasize what you're saying so that the audience can understand and you're pulling the audience in. And when you're doing it as a nervous gesture, that will be distracting. And that's one of the big things I learned. Um, and yes, I'm planning on calling her again because I, uh, when I have uh, new programs developing, I like to run them by her. And um, because I have had such a diverse career, I have expertise in so many areas. And um, it's been a very difficult thing learning to focus and then I had a couple of visits with two of my mentors, two very high-powered women last year, and they said, well, you stop trying to segment yourself to fit the market. You are Sally. We all know you're crazy. Now go market it. <laughs> 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 and so I no longer worry about that. I've taken all my many websites into one, and if you want to learn how to do storytelling, I can do that. If you want to use storytelling, to help build community, I can do that. If you want to learn how to use collaging and photography to do that, I can do that. If you simply want to learn how to make a living as a writer, yeah, I'm here too. You know, so we have all, I even do grant workshops because I've been very successful with grants. Um, I prefer when people use my books as points of reference because that's 
the essence of who I am, but I'm happy to do whatever it is they need me to do. And um, so the other thing that my acting coach has taught me is how to improvise on this stage. You have your script. You might even have a PowerPoint up there. But that doesn't matter. That's just that's just the uh, skeleton of what you're doing, and going off script if that's what the audience needs, is what you have to do. Um, and so th my acting coach helped me with being confident in my instincts when I'm reading my audience, and just connecting with them directly and getting a sense. I'm looking at you now. We're connecting, and I'm looking at you now. We're connecting, and I can then get an instinct of whether I am giving you what you need at that moment. And that was a great lesson, fabulous lesson. And it's also more fun that way because you get to meet people. <laughs> How about you, Mary, any speaking training? Uh, no. Um, <laughs> I, I did theater in high school as well, but um, I always ended up, uh, you know, I might, I might have a role on stage, but I always ended up like writing stuff behind the scenes mm -hmm. and having people act it, and then I found out that this is a big tangent, that if I tried to act anything I had written, I would fail immediately because I had all of the first drafts in my head, the previous <laughs> drafts. And so like, I was like, oh, I cut that line. Um, so, so that's actually like a challenge, right, um, to, to try and keep your own material on, on point. So um, I deliver a lot of, you know, to, to groups about this size, a lot of informational talks at work, you know, like here's interlibrary loan and why you should know about it, that sort of thing. <laughs> um, <laughs> which, let me tell you, and also, what do you feel about copyright law? You know, like, uh, you know, so I can, make, I can make information that I actually know a lot about be relatively engaging, um, and if I don't know about it, I struggle and flail and, and fall apart, and I have just as many, <laughs> I, have, I have mostly good stories about speaking, but like I did have a disastrous conference appearance, which, I will get into later what I think you're going to ask some other questions related to it, <laughs> but um, but but I tried to branch out into something I knew a lot less, and so I have no training other than like my own observations and and trying to be better and and just like my daily working life what it what it has taught me. So uh, I feel like I should seek some, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I um, did not come from an acting background, but I was a high school and college debater, oh, okay. and at a I, so I did a lot of public speaking as a debater, including um, policy debates and impromptu debates. Um, so I've been comfortable speaking for a long time. And then in my day job, before I became a science fiction and fantasy author, um, I worked in corporate American management consulting, so there was a decent amount of speaking to large groups there. Um, so I have, I've always felt pretty comfortable, um, well, not when I was a teenager and starting out, but <laughs> because I had that background, I felt pretty comfortable. Um, and I think that, uh, that that is one thing that I want to say, which is um, you have to want to do it yeah. mm -hmm. in order for that energy to come out to the audience. Yeah. I think if you're up at the front and you're nervous and you don't want to be there and this is like pulling teeth for you and um, you know, you're scared to death, the audience is going to feel that. Mm -hmm. And that will make for an unpleasant experience for everyone. Um, if you want to do it, and it's a matter of, I would like to put myself out there more, I want to gain more skills, you can absolutely find a way to do that there. You can take acting classes, you can join Toastmasters, you can honestly practice and do more of them. Because I think, like PJ said, the comfort factor is the key. Mm -hmm. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you get, and the more it just becomes like a conversation between you and you know 300 people. But it becomes a lot more natural and a lot more fun for everyone. Um, and I, I and I have found this to be the case with a lot of um, children's book authors because because middle grade um, uh, um, authors often do go into schools. The first few are really terrifying, mm -hmm. and then you know it becomes less so and less so, and eventually you know you're not not scared of them anymore. So my question next is, how do you go about getting these speaking engagements? Um, have they come to you? Have you done anything to go and solicit them? And what sort of marketing or promotional materials do you use to get these gigs? Um, why don't we start on this side, Mary? I have done nothing. Um, 
I mean, I think that there might be something deep on my website that says I'll do a free Skype visit um, or, or here's how to get a hold of me if you want me to come talk to your school. Um, but, and yet, people seem to find and ask me. So I don't know if there's some word of mouth factors going on, which I, I suspect mm -hmm. actually there, there probably is. is. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, you know, I've pretty much accepted almost everything that has come my way if it has been at all feasible to do it, and that, and that has, I'm sure, helped. Um, I have made a lot of mistakes in accepting. I have not asked the right questions every time, but, uh, you know, like, who's the audience? <laughs> that seems like a really obvious one to me now, <laughs> several years later. Uh, but at the time, I would be like, yeah, I'll come talk. I'll, I'll, I'll read your website and try to figure out what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so I've done very little. But um, I think that the thing that has gotten me recurring gigs is just not failing miserably at it. It's probably <laughs> not probably failing, it. yeah. always good. Yeah. Yeah. Go um, a lot of my gigs come from word of mouth, that's true, uh, from also people who've read my books and have questions because I'm not the kind of person that ties up endings with nice bows. I always leave, I write them with questions in mind and I and I feel like I'm very successful when my readers have lots of questions. Um, I do have a lot of material that I've been taught to have, and they seem to be very effective. And um, I have some printouts here, uh, but the, uh, almost all of this is on my website at sallywienagrata.com. Uh, one thing that professional uh, speakers are supposed to have is called a speaker one sheet. And it, it follows a basic format um, with uh, my bio, some of the topics I cover, quotes, where you can see videos. I'll get to videos in a moment, and about my books. And the audience here is welcome to take whatever printouts there are. But on the speaker page on my website, th there, it's downloadable. I have discussion guides or study guides for all my books. Uh, these are also, they're on the website. Uh, the website has a page for Winter, The Winter Boy and for JoJo, and they both have speaker guides. The people here are welcome to take some of these. Um, book club discussion groups love having discussion guides. Whether or not they follow them doesn't matter. <laughs> they love having them. And so, and it's just come up with questions that, um, they could be asking about the characters, about the plot, about, you know, and by the way, make sure some of your questions relate to how they think, they feel, or their personal experience. It's a very important key to uh, questions that discussion groups like to have. They like to bring it back to themselves. <laughs> so, and it, it's uh, actually um, what I always say to uh, book discussion groups when I speak to them. I also do Skype, but I prefer Zoom, by the way, uh, if you're going to do it. Um, one of the things is Zoom uh, is easier to manage, and it also allows you to, with their permission, to record. Um, I also have videos on my website. Uh, when I speak at um, writers' conferences or other places, occasionally I will hire my own video crew to come. And they interview me in this situation, they take pictures of me with my audience, and they also interview my audience afterwards, uh, select people in the audience. Those videos are like gold for getting good gigs. Hmm. Um, by the way, this speaker one sheet, in certain markets, it goes into the books, when the books are up for sale. In certain markets, the study guide goes inside the book. You just print it out, put it in. The other thing that I have that is not on my website is a brochure, gotprint.com. They do a great job, by the way. Um, they, uh, it's a nice trifold that gives people an idea of who I am, how audiences react to me, and such. And in certain markets, this is what goes into the books. And it also, when I'm at a, uh, if I'm at a school, I will give it to the teacher. I'll give it to the principal. If I'm at a, um, a discussion group, and I do discussion groups for free if, if it's within my home territory, or for free if it's by uh, Zoom, 
Um, I hand that out because the people in discussion groups are also part of organizations that hire speakers. And if they've enjoyed having you at their discussion group, they're going to enjoy having you there. Uh, I am preparing to start. I actually want to hire my own personal rep to make some cold calls. So uh, if anybody's looking for a job that is really eloquent on the phone and not afraid of cold calls, talk to me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I will give a big percentage of my fee for that. And uh, once my website is really, really ready, I will start looking at speaker bureaus because they can bring them in. But right now, it is a lot of word of mouth. Yeah, the issue of speaker bureaus is really in interesting because there's so few... Oh, first of all, none of us are res represented by a speaker bureau, correct? Right, right. Um, and when you look at the speaker bureau pages, these are agents for speakers. Um, they tend to be, you know, certainly in the world I'm in, you know, it's it's Ray Kurzweil and Peter Diamandes, and it, you know, it, it's all these name brands. Um, you know, it, it, if it's going to be between me and Michio Kaku, I think he's getting the gig. <laughs> um, so. Right. That's very true. Uh, so I think what's interesting about all of us is we're kind of filling that middle ground of people who they're not going to pay a superstar's fee, but they would like similar information. Um, I absolutely, I, I love the study guide thing. This is genius. Um, especially, so one of the speaking gigs I did recently was at University of California, Santa Cruz, uh, because they put revolution on their curriculum. Uh, so Crown College is the ethics and technology uh, sub-college, because sub, it's a sub-college system. Um, and they have a core curriculum class in ethics and technology. And because one of the professors is a friend of mine and she had loved the book, she actually got all the other professors in a student group to say, yeah, we want this on the curriculum. So that's a really good thing. If you can get your book onto a core curriculum of anybody's class. Um, it's the gift that keeps on giving. Um, so in terms of, of getting gigs, because that is the original question, because by the time it comes to me, I often forget. Um, <laughs> uh, it's so far, because I've been really concentrating on finishing this trilogy, it, I have really been letting things come as they come. However, I'm getting ready to enter the level now that you're talking about. Uh, my website basically does what her handout does, but I love the idea that she's got a handout. Uh, I don't have a study guide. That's fantastic because I think this might end up being more with, with other college classes because it really does, it, it's a deep dive into ethics, political philosophy, and technology and how does this all fit together. Um, the a lot of it is word of mouth. I'm actually surprised how much I've gotten from word of mouth. Mm -hmm. um, and I wanted to address something that you said that is so important. Get yourself filmed. I have the biggest mistakes I have made have been relying on a venue that said, and I'll ask, will you film me? And if they say no. I either, and there's no way for me to get, find a videographer there. I may turn down the gig because right now video is the most important thing for me. Uh, it goes, I have a channel. I have a website that sends you to the channel and you can see me talking. And if you can't see me talking, you're not going to hire me, right? You know, it's really as simple as that. Um, so what my website does, which is what her, her handout does, is it sort of sends you to those that, that video outlet so you can take a look. Um, I made a big mistake at this talk. They filmed me, but they're not film people. They, you know, they, they literally stuck the camera on top of the projector for my PowerPoint. So the whole, the whole video is, you know, and, and so, God bless them for trying. I really, really, really appreciate it. But I'm just trying to say, you know, this is, these are the vagaries I'm learning the hard way. Um, so if you've got a friend with a video camera who knows how to hold it right, <laughs> I really recommend every single one of your speaking engagements, no matter how small, that you get video of yourself speaking. Because it's so, it's, it is the currency on which you will get future gigs. 
yeah, uh, add to this. Um, it's very important. But um, in addition to having a page, uh, in addition to having my YouTube channel, I have a page of videos on my website. But in addition to having that, on each of the pages of my different topics, such as crossing the tribal divide or storytelling or whatever the uh, topics are, I will have videos and audio, if, like when I'm interviewed on radio or such, on that page so that they're seeing a description of what they can get from me, they're seeing quotes from audiences and video right there on that page. And they have, it's a full package. Um, it, they see me talking about um, uh, family misunderstandings or bias or you know divisiveness or inclusiveness. Um, they actually, and the videos must be very short. The longest video I think I have is seven minutes. Um, and so if you have a lot of material, which I do, I have, a, I have a friend who I hire who's a very good editor, and we find snippets, pieces of it. It doesn't have to be a cohesive statement. It has to be expressive of how you're going to be in front of the audience. And you can, um, you can end up with some very dynamic or interesting video that people go, I like what she's saying there, I want to hear more. It's very, very important to have good video. And it will, it, price, uh, you are going to spend a couple thousand dollars if you want a good one. I'm sorry, but you are. Well, find a friend who really knows what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm going to answer this question um, partly based on what I've done, but also what I've seen other people who have been particularly successful in school visits do, because um, it has not been a huge part uh, of my of what I do, because I actually am very cognizant about limiting how much speaking I do, um, because I have books to write. And so I have, I know fellow um, children's book authors who are on the road constantly, and we're going to talk about this later, about how, about how you balance it, but they have tons of school visits lined up, mm -hmm. and I've been careful to not overbook myself. So um, like many people have said, uh, the biggest thing has been word of mouth. You do an event and um, the most important thing is that you knock it out of the park because there's going to be people in that audience who then come come and invite you to something else and then some this, this turns into something else. So it really is, word of mouth is definitely the biggest thing. But I've also, um, I have uh, seen a lot of success with, with exactly what Sally had, which is the, the little handout, right? Like letting people know that you are available as a speaker, um, especially if you're going to go to an industry convention or if you're like at an ALA or something like that. I have a friend who, um, she does a ton of school visits. And what she does is she offers a discount if the school that she books at ropes in another school, like a referral. Mm -hmm. um, system. Oh, that's nice. So she'll get, so she'll book like a school visit and she'll say, oh, if you get, an, if you line up another school, either the day before or the day after that visit, okay. I'll give you a $200 discount. Like so that. she will end up and they'll be like, well, that's great, you know, because then they can also split the travel fare mm -hmm. um, pump component of bringing her out. So she'll end up with like five visits. Um, back to back and uh, and knock off like you know s five schools in a row and they're happy because they got a discount and mm -hmm. she's instead of going out there for one speaking engagement she's gone out somewhere for five speaking engagements so um, I've seen that work as well uh, um, question that I have uh, money how do you know what to charge right um, and has that uh, what did you start out with, and what kind of went into that consideration, and um, has that gone up over time? How have you benchmarked? Want to start? Uh, so I think the very first thing I got offered was uh, the Young Authors Conference in Michigan, which they're not doing at the moment because um, they lost all their funding for it. But um, uh, I think my initial reaction was, I have no idea. Is it at a hundred dollars? I don't. <laughs> so I asked them how much they customarily paid, and they were like, 500 And I was like, I don't think that's accurate. <laughs> so, so I asked around, and I think we ended up with like, um, I think 800 It was like for a day. So uh, I have a feeling that I have undercharged everybody every time, forever. Um, but I, you know, 
um, I don't mind at this point. <laughs> I think I'd mind if it was my actual, like, I mean, it's, it's bonus money for me at this point. So, um, and I don't obviously want to under, undercut the rest of the competition or give people a false idea, but at the same time, um, I also know schools and libraries are struggling. So um, I've seen a lot of things where people give discounts if it's within a certain radius from their house. So like I pretty much don't charge my local library very much um, and that sort of thing. Um, I uh, I really do kind of stick to this is how much money I ha would have lost by not going to work and by, you know, like not having my, my, um, my, my writing time in. Um, so but I have also learned to definitely charge for travel and oh, any yes. food and, and that sort of thing. Like, it, it's been a revelation. <laughs> oh, this actually costs money for me to do. Uh, I feel like I came, you know, from like a, a, a point of naivete about this whole thing. I was like, oh, it's fun and, and oh, crap. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> which I, you know, I've, I've become less naive as time has gone on. But, you know, if I look back and I only started doing this when I was 35, but I'm like, was I really 30? I feel like I was 20, like how little I understood about what I should be doing. Um, uh, when you look back at your 20 year old self and you're like, dude, should I have a checking account? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I sort of feel like that, that, so uh, I feel like you're gonna give us much more golden information and uh, <laughs> definitely pass it forward. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a lousy negotiator. I'm a typical author. Um, I have been known to give it away for free when I could have gotten a few thousand dollars. So I try to close my mouth when it's time to talk money and I let them talk. Um, I still give it away free locally. Um, any book discussion group that has at least eight people and it's easy drive for me, I'm there. They'll buy my books. It's good publicity. I meet some nice people. I get high on their nice reactions to my books and to my presence. If, you, if they have at least eight people, uh, I'll do a Zoom. The reason I say at least eight people because you have to have some minimum. And I figure that's a nice group. Now, if a group called me up and said, we have only six, do you think I'd say no? Of course <laughs> I wouldn't. But at least on my website, it says at least eight people. Um, Corporations won't even take you seriously if you don't start charging at least $3,500, at least. Cor uh, universities, it depends upon their budget, but many of them are the same way. Some of them are really struggling, and they, uh, 1500 uh, to 2500 um, is an acceptable kind of fee. Would you agree with that? Yeah. Um, there are times when I have, I've just said to an organization, what can you afford? And they'll say, we have 350. And I'll say, can you go 500 plus travel expenses? Because there's always some give in what they say they can afford. Um, I don't, I, and as I said, I have given it away for free too many times, which is why I'm looking for a rep <laughs> to hire who's going to make good money from me and um, I'm going to learn an interesting business. Um, the other thing that you have to also take into account is that I'm sure all of us are doing it out of passion. Mm -hmm. We love our topics. I love talking to a, a group of people that maybe never, t people in the audience never communicated with each other. They're from different backgrounds and they, they distrust each other. And suddenly I'm getting them to tell each other stories and I'm getting them to listen. The big question to me is always, are you listening to the other person? And I feel, so, I'm, I'm a dish rag because I put out so much energy when I speak, but I'm also so elated that I can't go to sleep for like hours and hours afterwards. It is such a high. And therefore, you can't trust me to negotiate these things <laughs> because I, I love doing this. And I think it, I think it shows. I think that's the other thing. You have, you were sa wh whoever said it on this panel, I think yeah, you said, yeah. you have to love what you're doing. And if you love what you're doing, you're going to have so much fun doing this. It's great. Well, everything they said, and. Um, <laughs> so I started out for free uh, because I honestly didn't think anyone would pay for what I had to say. Mm -hmm. You know, and that that is the honest truth. Um, 
And then I started charging and, you know, schools will pay. I found it, it depends like the public schools and I mean public colleges, it may be closer to 1000, but it may also be, you know, the better colleges may be closer to 4000 or 5000. Um, corporate gigs again can pay very well. And again, especially if they're like, please don't say that we didn't know what we were talking about. So you had to come in and talk to us about it. Um, and that can pay 10,000, you know, I'm hoping for, for 20, I'm, I'm happy for them to come, uh, <laughs> now and say, Hey, let's throw money at you and tell us about things that we have to pretend we know. Um, and and you get those gigs in, in really weird ways, by the way. Um, I got one of those gigs by uh, having dinner one night with these executives. It happened to be this weird dinner, long story. But uh, they were saying, oh, you write about this. Um, we're building robots, which was not their core business. And they said, yeah, we discovered that we can't build robots because what we want to do with them is going to be 20 years away. And I knew what their core business was. And I was like, no, it's not. You could take off-the-shelf off, this, off the shelf products right now. I could build you a robot with what I know exists right now that's being sold, and it would absolutely attack your core business. And they're like, but all the people we... But this is the killer. All the people we gave like hundreds of thousands of dollars to told us that wasn't possible. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, oh, God. You know, this is when I should have charged them hundreds of thousands of dollars. <laughs> Uh, but you know they had the big corporate, big futurist corporation with you know two dozen professional futurists, who were all you know with a big global name and with the who's who of the 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 international corporate 100 as their clients. And I'm just this lady at the table, um, who's saying, no, let me actually tell you how you're going to do that. And that's when they say, please come and talk to our people because you clearly understand things we don't. Um, so it can really range. You can have this incredible variety of people coming to you and saying, I'll, you know, I have nothing, but we really, and if I'm like, if anybody wants me to talk about empathy and technology and storytelling, I will come talk to you in the bathroom about it. <laughs> you know, this is, this is, this is truly my passion. Um, I have Facebook, you know, secret groups where we talk about it. I've got, you know, it, Yes, this is what yeah. it's about. Um, but if you want to pick my brain about robotics, then you're gonna have to pay me. So, <laughs> so that, that's really yeah. like where it comes. Uh, so I will do. Uh, there's three types of events I'll do, um, and the criteria are: my publisher sends me, huh. you're paying me, or I really, really want to do it. And some combination of those three would be best. I mean, it would, the best would be if my publisher sent me and they paid me and I really wanted to do it, but I'll settle for at least one of those. Um, and I think the general rule of thumb um, it, to go with is, you know, charge as much as it would take for you to be happy with doing this, even if it ends up sucking. Mm. So um, that's kind of your, your, your personal threshold, right? What is your own time worth um, to you? So that even if you go in there and there's like two people in the room and, you know, the tech doesn't work and the food is crap, you can go home and be like, okay, but I made X and that will make you happy. So that's kind of the baseline for yourself. Um, and then it's good to benchmark against others who are kind of at your level and doing something similar. So especially for um, authors, right, I started off at... Um, at, when I had one book, obviously, I like started off at a sort of an entry rate of being like, okay, well, that's sort of, uh, I don't expect to make like a lot off of this, but this will this will kind of cover what will make me happy for the day. Um, now that I have four books and a fifth coming out, I feel pretty confident in like charging more. Um, but also, uh, you will find like like um, PJ and Sally said, a wide range of like the budgets of your audience. So I've had everything from rich schools who have no problem flying me from like Portland to New Jersey to do two sessions to the school that um, turned me down because they found an author who could speak for like $50 cheaper because their budget was like that tight. Mm -hmm. So you get, you get a range um, and 
same with writing conferences. There'll be, you know, some writing groups who it's like, oh, we really, really want you to talk, but we can only kind of like af afford this small honorarium to, we have this huge conference and speaking fees. And so know whether or not, first of all, if you want to do it and what level will make you happy to do it. Um, and then, uh, and sort of uh, some of those intangibles weigh on you as well. Like, for example, I did a writing, a teen writing festival, which they didn't pay a ton because it was non-profit, but they're kids from, you know, disadvantaged or lower income school districts who really want to, are in creative writing classes. And you get to like, you get free lunch and a small honorarium, but, um, but it's a great day, you know? And, and so I was willing to do that for less. So you have to think about some of those. So because um, I wanna make sure we finish on time, I want e um, each of you to just quickly give uh, what piece of advice um, you think would be most valuable to someone, a writer who would like to build a speaking career out of their writing? You wanna start? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, they send you a fair n amount of paperwork when they when you start one of these gigs, but I think that you should send them some paperwork back. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the number of times I've waited for an in, you know, them to pay me could have probably been cut in half when if I had just sent them an invoice instead. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the pieces of paper I, re I recommend sending. Um, it seems like uh, waiting for them to send you a schedule is also a thing that, that occurs, and so I recommend sending them a schedule, a sample schedule of how you like the day to go. Um, make sure you know you're getting lunch. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. there, uh, SCBWI, the Society for Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, actually has sample contracts for these kinds of visits, so if you're not a member of that then I can't help you. Um, <laughs> but there are probably other sample contracts out there for sure. CIFWA? Do we know if CIFWA has? I don't know um, if they have school visit contracts, but they might have yeah, speaking I mean, CIFWA does have a speaker's so speaker so like to build one. Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> they do. There's we a speaker's, have a speaker's bureau. bureau. Yeah. I don't and know. And then ask them if they're selling your books or how they're planning to do that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so the, you know, it's all paperwork based, this piece of advice, my second piece of advice, cause I'm going to go ahead and take another one, yep. um, is to just make sure that you are solid on your topic that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, relating stuff to your books is nice, but sometimes it's not going to connect with the audience that you have picked up this particular occasion. Um, if you, if you find yourself running into trouble, no one outside of this room understands how the publishing industry works. So you can always... Uh, get a lot of mileage out of explaining how how to sell a book, um, and that is my backup plan for everything. And people are always just like biting their nails because they're so amazed that like all the stuff that we take for granted is like oh oh you get to oh and um, it, it's been very helpful to have that in my back pocket. If you're just setting out, you need a few things, and you can use your first gigs to get them. Um, you need quotes. You need, you need, after every gig, regardless, you try to solicit, did you enjoy it? Would, uh, what did you think of what happened? Uh, what was my high point? What was my low point? And you ask all these things, and you end up with these wonderful quotes, then you get permission to use them. So your first gigs are going to be practice gigs. Get those quotes. Once you're more comfortable, get a friend to videotape you. And all these things are part of the value of that presentation for you. So don't worry about earning money right now. Right now you're earning your port your, Platform. your yeah. portfolio, actually. You're developing a portfolio of what you can show people. And that is very important. Um, I'd like to take another one about the books being sold. One of the great, great ways of selling yourself and your books is if people are buying tickets to come hear you speak, suggest to the organizer for a few dollars they can get a book that's worth $25, $30 to give to their audience members when they buy the ticket. It adds value to their ticket, to the purchase, and you get 50, 100, 200 people with your book walking out. And you don't have to sell anything. I love that one. <laughs> so I'm just going to tell you guys, don't be afraid. You all have the ability, if you can speak to your friends, to your family, you have the ability to do this. And 
it seems really daunting because I'm sitting here listening to everybody else and going, wow, I should have done that. Oh, that's a really <laughs> good idea. Uh, <laughs> don't be afraid to try this. Because what's the worst, and I mean this truly, what is the worst that could happen? It's not your thing. And you move on. So I urge everybody to try this. It's a, if you enjoy sharing your ideas, this might be a very lucrative area to supplement your income from books and your other work. And I'll just close off um, by adding on to what PJ said in that, you know, there, it is hard to be a writer. Like we do a lot of research and thinking <laughs> and organizing to write a book. And really what goes into this, into the pages that make up the book, is a fraction of what we could talk about by the time we're done writing the yeah. thing, right? So. There's a lot, I mean, you may be able to talk about more than you think you can. Um, even something as simple as like, uh, like, you know, how, how do I, how do I research a book topic? How do I navigate publishing? How, um, you know, well, there's so many, whatever it is that you had to do to write the book, you can capitalize on it if you so choose. And it's one of those things where, you know, if, if you don't like to do it, don't do it. But if you if you think it's something you might have some interest in, you've got you've got nothing to lose um, because it can it can be a lot of fun and it balances out. Honestly, it balances out all the time we spend like just staring at the computer screen and mm -hmm. and doing our being in our own brains um, and will even help crystallize some of those ideas that you have to others. And it's very interesting the characters you meet. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. Are yes. very useful. Yes. Do we? Yeah. I ha we have time for like one, maybe two questions. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, yeah. Yes. So connecting is I'm looking at you. Landing is knowing that you've heard my message. Yeah. So. <laughs> 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 um, you know, and that's one of the, the, the tricks is mm -hmm. just keep looking certain people in the eye. Not certain, everybody. Everybody at some point, I'm looking at you in the eye. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to you. And I want you to hear my message. Mm -hmm. I can't do that talking there. I can't do that talking there. I can't do that looking around right. the room. I have to look at you. And ironically, looking at her will make it land with you. Mm -hmm. And that's the trick. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Well, on that note, thank you all for coming. Enjoy it. You're welcome to take yes. any of these flyers if you want to get a sense of how of these things. And we are around this weekend, so if you want, if you have additional questions, seek out the panelists.